risk of dying by suicide, like Nancy said, please call 1-800-273-8255. 1-800-273-8255. You could save the life of someone you love. You could save your own life. I wish I knew that number existed when I went off that rail. Thank you very much. We have support groups in the front that you can meet with afterwards who are here to serve in that way. We have people here who do healing work who are here to serve. And we all know that feeling is healing and that music is vibrational medicine. And so with that, um, I give you Laura Hewall, one-third of Sweet Cecilia. Thank you, Becca, for bringing that very powerful film. I'm sure the panel of experts will have a lot better things to say, so I'll do the, what I do best with God gave me, the gift of music. Um, as they said in the, the movie, um, hope is something that... Um, after suicide occurs in a family, it's hard to think that that, that word could ever exist, but um, hope. The song that I'm going to sing for you today is a song that I wrote called Red Bird Flies, and it's about hope, about hope that we will see our loved ones again, that they are with us all the time. And um, the song is just simply about people that were in my life that were taken very soon. Um, and then the last verse um, it's home for Lafayette. It's about the Grand Theater shootings, which will be um, the anniversaries on July 23rd this year. So it's for Jillian Johnson and Macy Bro as well. So um, I hope you like this song, and I hope I can get through it without crying because um, that, was, that was powerful. Doctors called it a perfect storm A week later she was gone Oh, how they cried I think of you when the red bird flies A country concert at the Cajun Dome Mother, daughter, date, they were headed home. A drunk driver took her sweet young life. And I think of her when the cardinal flies. Fly high and sing a song.
Thank you. I have one more song I'm going to do for y'all. Um, back in 2011, um, my uncle committed suicide. And, um, and it does change your family. It changes you forever, as I'm sure most of you know in this room. And so this song um, is about, the, about my healing, I suppose, or the, the beginning of my healing um, with the suicide. And um, this one's called Hard Pill to Swallow. Staring at your picture, I can't believe That you took your life and left this scene We're left here to do it on our own And you left me feeling all alone drugs back in that poor family struggling to pay their bills they're fixing ham sandwiches to feed their kids Thank you so much. Thank you, Becca Begno. I wanted to invite the panel to come up so we could be here already. So I'll invite the three panelists to come up at this time. Laura, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Mama, for coming with you. <laughs> so, um, you know, we are in a community. I couldn't afford to pay Laura to come, and I couldn't afford to pay the panelists, and I got two free tickets to come tonight for doing this, so it's about the community. It's like serious community. Um, so one of the panelists is a current professor at the university. Um, Lewis is um, practicing as a social worker. He's also a yeah, I, I, I say a Jungian analyst, but he studies Carl Jung, so he treats and uses symbolism, and he actually has the belief inside of him that you can get over mental illness. Why not? 
And uh, uh, Sarah Brabant is uh, in the middle of the panel. Um, she taught me death and dying at UL, and um, we've become friends and served together in a whole lot of ways. And the panelist nearest me is uh, Deanne Kalig, who now is, is uh, at the university and teaches death and dying. So the first question, um, I don't know if y'all want to start with a question or if y'all just want to say something. Why don't y'all just kind of say something or y'all want to start with a question? <laughs> okay, I'll give a question. Um, I have a pretty sick sense of humor sometimes, but humor is a big gift, you understand? So uh, I was asked, I'm not going to say anything crass, I was, I was asked by someone who um, couldn't be here to ask a question how I felt, or what I felt about gallo humor making us maybe desensitized to um, suicide. I had to ask her what gallo's humor was. So um, if y'all want to talk about that, if either of you would want to talk about, do you think there was a specific, um, sometimes on TV shows they romanticize suicide. Do you have any thoughts on how that affects everybody else? <laughs> Maybe I should tell a joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so don't dare me to tell a joke, you know. <coughs> so I'll jump on that one back. Okay, um, somebody's going to jump on this. Can you hear them? No. And I'm going to invite <laughs> Mike Blanchard to come up. <laughs> Well, I'll start off with my gallows humor. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody said, what are you doing here? I thought, good. I thought, thank you. <laughs> I thought you were retired, and I said, have you ever tried to say no to Becca Begna? <laughs> I See, wasn't threatening you. That's an example of gallows humor. <laughs> no, I think gallows humor. humor is something that, that backstage people need. Uh, I think in order to deal with certain things that they have to deal with. But I think it's very important that those who engage in, in uh, gala humor, one, not feel guilty about it, and two, make very certain that the wrong people are not privy to hear them. Uh, it does relieve the tension. It allows you to face truth. What? It allows you to face the truth by laughing without, without, it just, it's a very deep way of facing truth. Yes, but it has to be balanced. Exactly. Um, uh, does anybody have a question? I, w I wanted to ask Mike, um, Blanchard to come up and if you have a question he'll bring the mic to you whenever you do yeah can we take like down on the spotlight and up on the house light so for the panel the excellent panel. Um, what did y'all think of the film? I thought it was too long. <laughs> I thought it had some very good, important points that we would want to take away, especially if we didn't have much education on this subject, but I do think that it went on and on um, and, and maybe lost some of those points along the way. I think some of the most important points to take away are that we're social creatures and we need each other. Uh, we need, yes, our family and our friends, but we need the stranger that comes up to us and asks us what we want them to ask us, maybe not, but what we hope for them to ask us, maybe not, but what they instead may ask 
can you take my picture? We need everybody. And so I think those are important points to, to remember that without each other, humans don't survive. We need each other for survival. And the other point that I think we need to take away from this film is that pain is pain. Um, mental disease or mental disorder or mental health issues or whatever label we want to put on pain, it's still pain. And if we talk about pain in a physical sense, and, and I ask you what's the most important or severe pain that you've ever had in your life, and maybe you had a back surgery, maybe you had um, an arm that got broken, maybe, <clears throat> maybe you've suffered with debilitating rheumatoid arthritis, maybe you've had a baby. Um, <laughs> when you're in that moment of severe pain, if someone if someone says to you, balance your checkbook, you can't do that when you're in severe pain. It requires logic and the ability to weigh decisions. And when you're in pain, whether it's physical or emotional, psychic pain, brain pain, as Kevin Hines called it, it's still pain. And when people are in that kind of pain, they just want their pain to stop and they'll do whatever makes that happen. Whatever makes that happen, even if it wouldn't be the same choice they would make if they weren't in pain, when they could think logically and consider the options. I guess what I'll say is that uh, I was touched by the movie all the way through. Um, and, and he was touched we, longer than the women were touched. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to say something like namaste, uh, just as a, a gesture of something that I felt there, um, uh, a holiness, um, a, a peace, a calm, uh, a treating of a serious topic that was um, seriously done, and at the same time very well done, um, and touching. Um, that's what I have to say. I think my favorite part of it is something that I, uh, to hear it repeated so often, and every now and then someone would say, committed suicide. Uh, some years back, Compassionate Friends said, don't say committed suicide. People don't commit suicide. They die from suicide. And, and it's so true that we don't say someone committed uh, lung cancer, <laughs> or they committed this or that. And, and it, it was so, natural in the expression of so many people in that film. People die from suicide. Um, and I sat there thinking how far we've come from the stigma. I can't even imagine, and I, I thank you, Becca, for, for doing this, for seeing this film and bringing it, but can you imagine this even 10 years ago in Lafayette? And we would, at best, there would have been maybe the three of us and you and <laughs> maybe three or four of you. <laughs> uh, I, that was a, an amazing feeling of how far, how far we've come. So I want to thank, not the film, but you mm -hmm. for doing this. Baton Rouge who brought me. I just said to, she's not here tonight, but that's why it came. I saw it and I felt we needed it because we're a community. Um, does anybody no, else right have a hand up? Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to bring it to light. Look how many suicides have just happened with people we know, don't really know them personally, but we know them from TV. Why? Why? 
why could you beg it to help? Like I was telling you earlier, I want to die, but I don't want to do it. So what do you say to somebody like that? My, ex my experience with suicide is, is multiple. Uh, my grandfather, my former husband, uh, several very good friends and a cousin died from suicide. Uh, I have been suicidal myself. And I have also had the privilege of being with people who were suicidal. I think what this film showed, which is so important, is that we ask questions. We ask people, how are you? And when they say, I'm fine, to say, you don't look fine to me. And to actually ask, are you thinking about killing yourself? You know, we were taught you never mention because I remember, it was my understanding that I could cause someone to kill themselves by asking them that question. And we know now that's not true. Many, I was in the early AIDS epidemic and many, many of those young men wanted to die from suicide and they talked about it a lot. Uh, to me, they didn't talk to the social workers because the social workers were mandated to report them. And I wasn't. <laughs> what I would respond when they would tell me that they wanted to die from suicide was, what are you going to get out of it? I'm a sociologist. <laughs> and their answers maybe would address what you're saying. Some fear dying alone, in pain, or with no dignity because they knew they were going to die. And we could provide answers to that. Acadiana Cares could say, you won't die alone. You won't die in pain. And we will protect your dignity. Interestingly enough, a lot of them told me, I want to piss off my mother. <laughs> And my answer or someone else. And my answer would be, well, what if you don't? That would be dying in vain. That would truly be dying in vain. And, and, and they would say, well, maybe I better live. Then I can be sure I miss her. But the most interesting answer of all that I get and that I share with you is because I don't want to die, I'm terrified of dying. And this will mean I don't have to die. Rarely did I get the kind of answers that other people get. And I know that those probably don't answer your question. Because I think most of the time it's just I don't have any other options. And I cannot live with this pain. I did, I, do you have another question? No. But that, that's the best that I can bring to you. So what is the answer? Who knows, but we'll never know unless we ask them. Mm -hmm. And thank you for asking that question. I want to add something to I'm also a sociologist, so we have that. And she is my teacher of death and dying, I'm too. I'm taking the class. So, <laughs> um, but what we as sociologists, we don't prescribe. Uh, we don't write prescriptions out. But whenever I talk with people, I often prescribe, and I give homework. And, um, and one of the things that I find the most valuable in my, in my prescription writing is hugs. I prescribe hugs, <laughs> lots of hugs. And, and they may be verbal hugs and start with me. Um, and they may be real hugs. 
and start with me. Because I think we go back, you know, all of us to there was a caregiver at some point in our lives. Um, maybe it was our mother, and that's sort of the, the figure that often iconic figure is a, of a loving mother, unconditional, always available, meeting all of our needs. And I think a hug is representative of that. And we start with that basic need when we're born, before we're born. And we need it until we die, until the last moment of that last breath. And I think that's what I would say to you is, can I hug you? Yeah, because when you don't have one, he wants to hug you. What do you do? You know, I just got a miserable Siamese cat that is just mean. <laughs> He's mean. We need to get a nice cat. Well, she's Siamese. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, and it, it's just hard. It's like when you don't have anyone. Right. It is and it's not that I would do anything. I just know what I want. You know, I mean, I just don't want the pain anymore. And that's what I hear. I don't hear I want to be dead. I no. hear I want my pain to stop and I want to be loved and feel connected. Mm -hmm. And that's what we all need as humans to survive. We should, all of us, do more of that loving. I think I want to give her a hug. <laughs> that's fine. Group hug. So one of the things I, I just heard is is uh, is the pain. And I just wanted to bring in into the thought of, of everyone here that substance abuse, whether it's uh, alcoholism or drug addiction, is a way to self-medicate so you don't feel the pain. And mental illness is a way to separate whether you come back with PTSD because what was so unbearable was unbearable, so you, or you have split personalities after you've been uh, raped or after someone has abused you. So mental illness is a way to uh, preserve yourself by escaping but still being here. And so um, it's about pain. Now, I just want us to remember that um, Often we judge people also who have addictions and at some deep level they're in pain. So I just have a comment. Please. First of all, Becca, thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing your gifts with us through your pain. And um, I just want to respond to the lady, which of us do not want to die to the horrible things that are going on in our lives today. Which of us would not want to die from that? But there is hope. And every day without my God, I could never continue. From what we've, I've seen in hospitals and suicide and death and horrible things that have happened, Without my God, I could not survive. And, um, and through seeing that and what's going on in our world today, children dying of hunger, um, suicide, how many in just a minute or so, um, we would be psychotic if we didn't want to die seeing all of these things. And maybe that is why we become psychotic. And um, thank you for giving me the hope tonight, too, Beth. Thank you. And thank you all, the panel. Thank you. There's also a generational thing that I, I want to just bring up. So as you ask and as they answer, um, when I was 12, my father died from suicide. and. Then my daughter died from suicide years later in 2012. So the bridge I carry with me is not the Golden Gate Bridge, but I bridge two generations. And how we viewed suicide uh, in 65, and then in my lifetime, and then how we view it now, 
sociologically it's changed and when you talk about this through sociology or anthropology it doesn't matter where you go to church or what your specific concept of God so sociologically we're changing and and this gives us an opportunity to talk about it in that way without so much it's either my way or your way or um, my culture does it like this and my church does it like that. so it, it allows us I think um, so I'm just grateful for these people who are not just sociologists, but caring. Um, so, Lynn, you have a mic, please, Lou. I'm gonna say this. Um, the name that I carry, Louis Archibald, I was named after a man who in a psychotic break was taken to Charity Hospital in New Orleans and after he was there for about two weeks, he took alcohol off a nurse's cart. He was in a ward. And he sprinkled his bed with the alcohol. And at that time, if you remember that long ago, you could smoke in hospitals. <laughs> and he set his bed on fire. I didn't know about this until I was 40 years old. Uh, after I married, um, my aunt had given me a picture of me as a young boy. And the picture fell off the counter that we had put it on. And behind the picture of me, there was a picture of my aunt, her toddler daughter, and her husband. And part of what I saw immediately in the picture was that I had never seen that look on my aunt's face. She was at peace. She was lovely. And I had never seen that. She and her daughter, after her husband's suicide, had come to live with my mother and father. I was told, because I had his name, I suppose, that he had died by a heart attack. I was 40 years before they could tell me the truth. Things have changed a bit. And seeing this movie uh, reminded me of the fact that I carry the name of a man who committed suicide. Some kind of way my mother decided she liked this man and wanted me to have his name. And I think that in some kind of way she knew that I was going to work in the arena of mental illness. <laughs> Everybody has a story, and everybody is so connected. It's amazing. Um, is, is there anyone with a question? Yes? Um, Wait, he's coming with a mic. We'll make it easy. Um, in the movie, they were talking about uh, the language that's used around suicide and how you were saying how people don't commit suicide, they die from suicide. And in the um, movie, one of the gentlemen were talking about how they didn't even die from suicide, that they died from depression. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you had, um, maybe any, could explain that a little bit more, or maybe even a more productive or like helpful way of, of languaging that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I understand one of the things she said was that you don't commit suicide, you die from it, from it or depression. Like, you don't, you can catch a heart attack, but you don't commit a heart attack. So there's something about the will of you to die as part of committed, because you committed that, it's like you committed a crime, so we can hold that against you forever. And, um, Sarah always, I thought about her so often in the movie, like, how many, how many people would she have corrected by now? So would one of you want to address that in a greater way? I, 
I think, well, I know, basically, uh, it takes away the stigma. Uh, a, a, a person, when she says, uh, why do people commit suicide? Because there's no other choice. The pain, however they express it, is overwhelming. And so to, to say they committed as though with a fully conscious mind and lots and lots of options, they chose to, to die. They chose to kill themselves. And, and that just keeps the stigma going. So they must have been terrible people. You have to remember that it wasn't too long ago that you couldn't be buried in a Catholic cemetery if you killed yourself. You had to be buried outside of it. So it was a crime. It's still a crime, I think, in most states, isn't it? I think it is. To kill yourself. So how can we have compassion when that is how we think about people who make this final choice that is the only choice they have to stop this pain? Does that answer your question or address it? Um, kind of. Uh, also, in the movie, um, one of the gentlemen were talking about how he had a friend that died from depression and not suicide. I, yes. I don't know if maybe there's a more helpful way of languaging it around um, something like that, or I don't know, just kind of breaking down a generality. I was uh -huh. just kind of curious. Do either one of you want to? Yes. I'm not sure that I can mandate it, um, but. <laughs> if we could just say that people died from pain? Yeah, I was just curious this is on your thoughts. You know, they used to actually, was that 200 years ago, they would put cause of death of a broken heart, would sometimes actually go on the death certificate. Now, maybe we bring that back. Because I think it is a broken heart, you know, in a metaphorical way. So, for your consideration, <clears throat> uh, my sister is sitting to my right, and our younger sister, Ruthie, com completed suicide in about 2003. And the reason I say completed suicide is because I was instructed by our, uh, or advised, or it was suggested by the neuropsychologist that my mother and I were seeing. Uh, in Baton Rouge who had said, you know, be happy for her. She has finally completed something she's been trying to do for 30 years. So I've been married to Ruthie completed suicide. Now, I, um, the phrase died by suicide sounds gentler or something, um, but that's what we've been saying for, um, you know, since Ruthie's death. And by the way, Becca sang at Ruthie's gravesite. Becca sang Amazing Grace way back when. So that just completed suicide. That's what I've been married to. But now I like that died by suicide. It just sounds. But one of the things, graceful. One of the things about um, we're gonna all die of something, okay? So like I didn't die of cancer, but I'm gonna die. Uh, there, there's so much emphasis on uh, if you don't have cancer for five years, you get a party. You know, if I tell you I didn't see a psych psychologist, psychiatrist, or have a psychiatric hospitalization for five years, nobody ever wanted to give me a party. 
we have this like total physical is okay, but I'm never going to get that, and y'all are nuts forever. So there's, you know, we have to have some way of of seeing the difference, and I think by suicide rather than commit. Depression talks of an illness, the illness that ended up, you know, mental illness can be terminal, but we don't think about that, because they're just like wigged, but oh, if you have cancer, we're gonna take care of you. So I think part of that too is the uh, mental, as, as not being perceived or viewed as an illness, but physical illness, you're sick, but oh, you just, well, we have other words for, you have a question? I just wanted to make a comment. Sorry, this is kind of... Okay, can we have some, like, let us see each other? Light. More lights? <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment on what you said. And I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but the way that I'm kind of processing it um, is, um, like, suicide can maybe sometimes be a reaction or action to, um, like, a de de to depression. So... Depression is actually the root cause to that resulted in, in that action. So that's kind of how I'm understanding it. I don't know if that helps or gives you clarification, but um, that might that may be what led them to say that comment. You know, depression is um, the, actually the cause in that situation that resulted in the suicide. That's kind of how I'm understanding it. So hopefully, um, like I said, I don't, I don't have any qualifications to say what I have to say, but. Um, that's just how I'm processing it, and so that might be helpful in some kind of way. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any of my very much. I have a question in case um, someone approach you as um, when you get in a situation that someone will share with you that is thinking about attempting a suicide, but something about that uh, but the frame that I want to put it in is much broader uh, and in some ways more particular because I, I want to say living is hard enough wanting to live is difficult uh, wanting to live has its its good points uh, but I think that many people uh, have thoughts about dying and, and death and uh, killing themselves I think that's something that we all go through. If we can understand that that's part of an ordinary experience of life, it becomes easier for us to cope with the issue. Am I gonna live, am I gonna die, do I wanna live, do I wanna die? Uh, part of my experience comes from, uh, like Becca, the cancer side, because my brother was, uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer and I was diagnosed with prostate cancer about six months later and somewhere in there my brother died and I'm living and it's like that's difficult all by itself because there's a grieving process that you have to go through and you have to want to live and there's nobody who can make me want to live <coughs> And you, I can't make anybody else want to live. And if somebody is in my office and talking to me about significant serious issues, I can't make them want to do anything about that because they're free and they have their own intelligence and their own reasons for feeling and thinking the way they do. And I may be able to point this out or point that out or help them to see something but it's like the context is living is hard, dying is hard, deciding that you're going to die. That's a difficult thing. But it's also, it's about pain and how you're going to deal with it and are there ways for you to face it. 
And that's always mysterious because what gives me the motivation to want to live? You know, you can't just grab that. It, it's more like something that happens to you and you get it and, and you can live. Uh, but if you're having difficulty holding or carrying the burdens that you've got, who's going to give you what it takes to do that? I certainly can't. But something can. But can you find it? So there's always something that's out of our reach that we're reaching for, that we would like to have, but also that's beyond us. So there's always mystery there. And I think that's an important piece. But that's also where hope comes in. Yeah. Because if hope helps you look and reach and see maybe a slightly different way, and you can say, oh, I can live with that. Well, that's something, because you're finding a way to adjust and adapt to what you're having to carry, what you're having to lift and load, and you're saying, okay, I'm going to live with that. And that in itself is as much something that happens to us. It's what, in a religious framework, you would call grace. But it's also a psychological decision that we make, responding. But it's all kinds of things working together that bring us into that place. And you can't just grab it or tell somebody, you got to, because it doesn't work that way. That's what I have to say. Thank you. I think one thing we have to remember is that we all in this room have the power to leave and die tonight. But there's such a great fear of death, there's even a greater fear of mental illness in some ways, because that's a lack of control. Dying is, but we got to see this man who wished he hadn't jumped off before he hit the water, and it kind of takes, or maybe puts the mystery back, we can't know what other people are thinking. So kind of when you, someone is, is sharing that I would like to do that, you can just know or say, well, I know you want to, but what do you really want to do? I know you can, but I know what, but what do you want to do? Their, their wanting to live is usually has something else, like Sarah said. I'm sorry. I wanted to go back to your question. I may have broken. <laughs> or uh, if I was in your situation, and I'm trying to see where you are, get there you are. Um, because the person is coming to you, they are in, a, in effect asking for help because they've said that to you. So I would see that, I would interpret it that way myself if I was in that situation. And I would say to them, and I have many times, uh, sometimes it's a student who's standing in front of me with a late paper, and I, I just read something different that day in their demeanor. Um, and sometimes it's someone that I'm working with really closely, and I know them very well, and I definitely pick up something different in their behavior, and I ask about it. And I'm, I'm very direct about what I'm asking, and I, I will say, are you thinking of hurting yourself? You seem very upset today. I care about you, and that's the, the reason I'm asking. And I, it matters to me what happens to you, and it matters to me that you get help, and I'm gonna go with you now. I'm gonna bring you, even, and get you to some place that feels safe, and that we can get you the help that you need and the supports that you need. Um, just that one person, you, may be the person who's telling them what they need to hear. They don't need an expert, they need a human connection and you being the person they're reaching out to you to that's the first connection if you don't feel that you have all of the the tools in, in your um, pocket that you need you do have them caring that's what you need and if you can just say that I care what happens to you and I want to make sure that if you need help you get that help I'll help you get it that's what I would say What do you do 
if they have a fear, there's already been an attempt, and so there's been hospitalization, and that didn't go well in their perception. And so there's a fear of being hospitalized again and going through that ordeal, and so there's um, resistance, you know, to any kind. You know, if I go talk to anyone, they're going to commit me. That's, that's exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, it's happened. I mean, I, you know, and it's like, no, I, I don't feel like living, but I won't hurt my, I won't harm myself. There's a whole difference in that. But to make people understand that, some people just can't get it. one that works. This is the one that works. I, I hear what you're asking. Um, I have called the police. Mm -hmm. I think there comes a point when an individual with very few choices is trying to make a choice and I, as a human being, have to make a choice. And I've always been grateful, far more grateful to sociology than to the church <laughs> for statistical analysis. <laughs> because in statistical analysis, you are not asking whether something is right or wrong, or true or false. You're asking which is the worst choice to do one thing or not to do it. And I think that's, well, I know that is where I am and where I've been. If I make the choice, is it, is it better for me to make the choice to remain this person's friend and have this person die or to lose this friendship and bring in someone who's better qualified than me. And that makes it simpler for me. If I, if I try to deal with, is this right or wrong, I, I, get, I get off. Mm -hmm. um, I once spoke to a man who had called and asked me if I would come to New York, he had AIDS, and be with him when he self-delivered. And I thought about it, and I called him and told him that I couldn't. Uh, and he cursed me. <laughs> he said, I hate you. I thought you were my friend. Now I know you were not. And I would call him, but he would never receive my call. And then one afternoon, about four weeks later, I got a phone call from him, and he said, you know, I've decided to self-deliver, and all my friends are really for it, <laughs> and they've made big plans, and he said, I'm not sure this is what I want to do, and he said, you did what you thought was right for you, so I decided to call you. Should I, well that right there has got that nasty word, knows you're in trouble. Should I self-deliver? I don't know whether it's right or wrong. And that was when I first hit on our statistical analysis. This was Martin Levine, a famous sociologist. Um, he, uh, I said, I don't think it's a question of whether it's right or wrong. The questions are, would it be worse for me to live when I should have died or to die when I should have lived? And he said, I've got to think about that. <laughs> he decided not to self-deliver. And I spoke to him shortly before he died, which was a blessing for me. 
But I think in answer to your question, you have, we have to, or I have to decide, what can I live with? And at one time I did, I called the police. The person had taken pills. The voice was beginning to slur. And did it destroy our friendship? Yes. She's never had anything to do with me since. People who die from suicide have no choice but to get away from a pain. Those of us who are not in that intense pain have choices to make. And so one of the things that um, Sarah told me once, because Looking at things sociologically lets you look at it from a really different perspective. Um, she worked with her guys at St. Luke. St. Luke was a, a hospice for people with AIDS. And even here in Lafayette, as loving as we are, we had to have this place be a secret. Now, why would we have to have a secret place for homosexuals to go die? Because we would bother them. Which just kind of says what kind of society we have sometimes, okay? So uh, I want to congratulate all of you for coming and learning about death and dying and owning death and dying and owning suicide. And Sarah told me once, she says, you know, I thought we're not taught death and dying. I was teaching people about death and dying, but I was really teaching them about living. And so hopefully we have a freedom to live after coming together tonight. And I just wanted to add that. Thank you for being brave enough to come and be with us. Yes, you can say a lot of things. Mm -hmm. One who has lived after the person has died from suicide, and and I want to I want to address that. I I really cannot say enough about Mary Langford's book, uh, That Nothing Be Wasted. Uh, I carried this for months. <laughs> it's small, it goes in your purse, you can pull it out. When my former husband died from suicide, I, it, they spoke about the shock and the anger, and I don't know what the Two of you felt I had an overwhelming sense of relief. I didn't have to worry about whether the gas can was out. I didn't have to worry about him suddenly being there. He was dead. And I felt so guilty. What kind of decent human being, which I thought I was, felt nothing but relief? And so I wanted to share that if any of you have ever felt that. I'm still relieved that he's gone. He's dead. He can never hurt me again. But I don't feel guilty. It's how I feel. I'm a human being. And I found that in her book. The two feelings to get away from are guilt and shame. I really believe that they are the tools of Satan. I don't think they are normal, natural, in any way whatsoever. But I did want to share that to any of you out there who may be survivors, uh, if you need help, get help. And if you go to somebody who can't give you the help, walk out until <laughs> you find somebody. Yes, I'm still relieved. And I don't feel guilty. Thank goodness for this book. Yes, yeah, someone. I I'll give you mine.
<laughs> I brought one. So I think this sort of gonna be a melee for, for Beckins, but I have one and it's yours. This is, a, I guess, a comment. Many of us here have lost loved ones to suicide, and I strive not to say committed suicide because we've all lost loved ones probably to suicide, but we've lost loved ones by other means. My mother died of a heart attack. I don't say, you know, I don't say that in a negative way. You know, nobody talks to me and said, oh, yeah, your mother died with a heart attack. So I think sometimes when we say committed suicide, we extend that stigma. It's unfortunate that Robin Williams, Kate Spade, uh, Anthony Bourdain, you know, my daughter, will always be remembered for their very last act. There's more to, to Robin Williams' life, there's more to Kate Spade's life than that last act that she, she did or he did. You know, so I think that when, when we say committed suicide, we're extending that, uh, that stigma. And, and I think when we, what we've got to do is strive not to remember that last day, that last act of our loved ones. Because we kind of get stuck in, in that grief because it, it's always there. So we try to remember the, the, the previous years of their life and not that last day and that last moment. It's just a comment that, that has helped me tremendously to try not to remember that last moment. You know, it's very unfortunate that's how they died. But I don't remember my mother dying of a heart attack and remember, oh, that's the way she died. I remember those other 85 years that, you know, that she lived. It's not so much how they died, but that they died. Yes. But we make it about how they died. Unfortunately, yes. And so, um, I, I would like to know what time it is. Okay, um, I'm going to tell y'all something that I think is funny. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a question about how to see the warning signs in, uh, for suicide on social media. If they're the same as whenever you're like, just meeting someone, or is it different warning signs because you can't see the person and how they're acting and stuff like that. You can only see what they're posting on social media. And also is social media a good place to go for help? Um, because I know some people who are join groups on social media for different things. Uh, is, is that really a good place or should you encourage people to actually go and find help with a counselor or a therapist? <laughs> you know, the, the answer to your question is going to be very practical and what works for some people, a, a social media site may help them very much. Uh, I know of some people who have used, for instance, uh, a, social, a social media site to deal with a, an addiction to porn. Uh, you can find sites that are very helpful. There are not, it's not everybody who's gonna wanna do that. Some people are gonna wanna face to face. Some people won't. And it really depends a lot on the person and what works. And, and you know that's a, that's a gospel principle. By their fruit you'll know them. It's what actually helps. If it doesn't help, it ain't good, period. <laughs> Thank you. So I just wanted to say that in being the bridge of two generations, uh, I was one of the first volunteers with the Extra Mile, and in, I think, 92, I won a prize as a client of the year. <laughs> okay, so we go a long way to say the things in the right way, but you know, it doesn't matter what you say. You know, as you... So my, at that time, my son was working at Tampico's. He was in high school, I think. He hadn't graduated. So I go and some of his friends are there and one of the bartenders comes up to him sitting at a table except it's round and they said, oh, mom, congratulations. I I heard you won a prize, and I'm like, oh, shut up. <laughs> I kept that under my breath, you know, and so I'm sitting by these three people. There's one guy and two girls, and the girl closest to me said, oh, congratulations, what did you win? <laughs> so I said, well, consumer of the year. 
So then, so then, she said, more than anybody else? I'm like, I was a consumer for the whole state of Louisiana. I'm not the craziest person in the whole state. I said, um, no, I, I, no. Well, what did you consume? God. So then I just, you know, you tell the child or you answer the question, even if it isn't a child, only what you want. <gasps> Mental health services. So then she looks at the other lady across the table. She, she points to that other lady. She says, oh, you should talk to her because she works with the developmentally disabled. And I said to her, I'm crazy. I'm not retarded. You know, so instead of deciding that it's okay to have a mental illness, you can't say that. So we're going to find a name that has no charge and it's going to be neutral. But if you still treat them like they have mental illness in that ugly way. It doesn't matter what we call each other, it matters how we call each other. So the young man that was sitting between these two girls, he left the table because I scared him. <laughs> you don't have to do too much. So at the end of the evening, my son was at the door and he, there's another circle of people and the young man was there and so he, he looked at this show, he said, did you meet my mama yet? Nope. He gets like all serious, you know. And then he does this. I mean, serious. He goes, you mean the case? And so he just, you know, put his arm around me and pulled me next to him and says, yeah, that's my mom. So there's something about being open about this. But all of my openness did not stop my child from taking her own life. So it's the question of you can only answer for yourself. We can't answer for other people. So I just want to thank you for coming in and being open and being here. And I don't know if that's gallows humor, but I can laugh. Um, thank you. You have something else? It is entirely possible that someone contemplating suicide came here tonight. If you are contemplating it and you came here tonight, please, please come up and let us know. Don't go out into that dark alone. I will stay here. We will be here. I got up at 5 o'clock this morning to be on TV. <laughs> Y'all got this. <laughs> Y'all wouldn't come, huh? We will be here. <laughs>